Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to another episode of uh, Nothing is Off the Table. I'm your host, Andy, and we have with us tonight, back from the dead, Chad. Not really back from the dead, but anyway. Pleasure uh, to be back. Yeah, I'm glad you're back, buddy. Tonight is our first live show, and it's going to be probably a controversial one for for some people would say. Um, Our guest for this episode is Mark Sargent. Mark is a a flat earth, I guess, uh, theorist. I'm not sure what we'd call him, but uh, we're super happy to have him here with us. And uh, Mark, welcome to the show. Hi, guys, and thank you very much for having me. No, well, yeah, well, the pleasure's all ours. Um, So we were just kind of talking a little bit offline before we started, and you've done probably hundreds and hundreds of these interviews. Uh, this, I kind of stopped counting after 200, to be honest. (laughs) I, I, and again, the fact that I would do 200 interviews on Flat Earth is, is still mind blowing to me. Oh, I bet it is. It's, um, wow. So I've got to ask you, Mm -hmm. uh, what, first of all, you want to give us a little introduction to yourself and and what your background is? Sure. Sure. Uh, my name is Mark Sargent. I, I you know, I'm, I'm going to go with what you said, a flat earth theorist. Why not? And I've been doing it since 2015. I started my career in the computer gaming industry. I played games professionally when I first started back in, oh boy, late 90s. That dates me. And then went transitioned from that over to proprietary software where I traveled around the country and taught blue collar factories how to run very expensive and complicated software and boiled it down for them. And then in 2014, I got into this. I mean, I, I was, I've always dabbled in conspiracies. I, I had an opinion on just about every conspiracy you could think of, which is why I got into this, because I was bored with all the other conspiracies. And, and everybody knows about Flat Earth. Everybody's heard about this since they were kids, and everybody hates it, including me. And I hated it so much that I decided to debunk it, like a lot of people. The t-shirt should read, I got into Flat Earth because I tried to debunk Flat Earth. And that was in the summer of 2014, and nine months later, I'm banging my head on the keyboard going, it can't be, it can't be, no way. And I decided to to flip and go the other side and say, okay, you know what? I can't prove the globe uh, from a court of law standpoint anymore. So I'm going to make a series of videos called the Flat Earth Clues. And it's basically just this cry for assistance. You know, it's like, please, please, internet hive mind, tell me where I'm wrong here tell me how this can't uh, how how this can't be happening and instead of academics calling me up and saying that yo well you obviously made errors in your calculations here's where everything went wrong uh, the opposite people started calling me almost immediately and wanted to talk to me about it and then i had subject matter experts talking to me about it and the community started growing and growing and growing and growing and here we are three years later uh the first international conference was last november in raleigh the second one's coming up in denver this november i'm going to a canadian conference in august just got back from los angeles where i was you know did a thing with national geographic love to see how they spin that and it's it's just been a whirlwind i mean i literally have had i there's it it's covers all demographics to where i you know i'll i won't give you give it all away but while i was down in in los angeles i met up literally with celebrities well-known celebrities who were saying that oh yeah they're they're into this and got a phone call um from my my cousin just after i got back said oh yeah by the way i was uh, in Manhattan, talking to some Wall Street power brokers, and they're totally into this, and and you know, drop names. It's like holy smokes, where are we going with this? So yeah, that's where we are now, and uh, here I am talking to you guys. And I, where are you guys located again? We're we're actually in Virginia, Chesapeake, Virginia. Oh, cool. I'm out here in just north of Seattle, Washington, on a little rural island called Whidbey. W H I D B. I lived there for five years. You lived on Whidbey Island for five years? I lived, I lived in Oak Harbor for Holy five years. Holy so! Oh, you were in the Navy? Yeah. Eh, <laughs> that makes sense because there's yeah. a, a Navy base on the north end of this island. Yeah, I'm I'm on the south end. I'm, I'm yeah, Langley or... Yeah, yeah, down here. Yeah, I grew up... Uh, yeah, I'm just... I'm in between Langley and Freeland. Oh, right so, on. Yeah. It's got, it's a small world. Go yeah. figure. Yeah. 
Anyway, so Mark, before we get into the, the flat earth thing, you said something that piqued my interest. You said you used to be a professional gamer. Yeah. I want your opinion on uh, uh, the Billy Mitchell scandal. The Oh, from King of Kong? Yeah. Um, which, I don't even know what you're talking which, about. Okay, right? sorry. There was a, sorry, I'll, let, me, let me back the audience yeah. up. So there's a documentary out there that was made a few years ago uh, called The King of Kong. And if you're old enough to play stand-up video games from the 80s, and it sounds like you are, uh, <laughs> then you would really enjoy this because there was a lot of uh, you know people that were doing. In fact, I'm in. It's funny enough that you would mention that. So the um, uh, the guy the the guy that helped make the documentary, you know, the arcade owner. Uh, yeah. the, so I actually spoke with him many times because I'm actually in his video game book of world records. That's how I got the gig to play video games for a living. Uh, so I knew it. So when he's on the screen, I'm watching them going, Oh yes, what's his face? So, um, yeah, small world, but the Billy Mitchell, you know, he is, uh, I, I can't really talk badly about the old school game gamers. Cause the, you know, we're all, you know, we all come from somewhere, sure. but he makes such a great villain <laughs> in that like, movie. He, he got- I mean, he is. He is so 80s arrogant. It's it's staggering. But at the same time, you need that. Without his character in there, what do you got from that documentary? It, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating, fascinating take. So, yeah, I, I totally I, – I dig. And there's another smaller version of that um, documentary. Oh, geez. It was based on a really obscure snake game. Um, crap. You guys will have to look it up offline. But, yeah. but, they, but Billy was in that as well. He he's he was like this consultant on the outside. Like you're you're gonna go to him for sage like wisdom when it comes to eighties arcade stuff. So yeah, interesting you'd bring that up. Hairstyles, yeah. like a sweet mullet like that. <laughs> oh hey, par- party! I'm sorry, business business in the front, all party in the back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, his his hairstyle. I don't think he's ever changed it ever ever. Um, so let me the the flat earth thing, right? Yeah. So. I got to tell you, I've watched a bunch of your videos, watched a bunch of stuff, mm-hmm. and and I'm on the fence. Okay. <laughs> but here's the deal. Yeah. I have personally uh, been in charge of the navigation for a ship and over the course of my career, mm-hmm. circumnavigated the globe. Sure. <laughs> so, so, so did, so did uh, Magellan. Well, he didn't make it all the way around. Uh, whatever. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Semantics, right? But you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. I do. I, you know, if I I know that if I keep going west, yeah, I have to go through certain bodies of water. Right. And if I keep going west, yeah, and I go through certain canals, I'll end up back where I started. Yep. I know that for a fact. Oh, I've I have no doubt. I have no doubt that you did, but did you go? Work? Did you go around a globe, or did you just go around a dinner plate? Because technically, I could run my finger in a big circle on the edge, or you know, whatever size circle you want, on the interior of a dinner plate, and technically, I've circumnavigated that plate. So, who's to say that it wasn't a two-dimensional object and not a in, instead of a three-dimensional object? Because remember. On a, a flat world, the compass is in the, you know, the, the magnetic north is in the center of the plate. And the compass works just the same as it would on a globe. And I'll take it one step further. And I, I won't rattle off all the subject matter experts right now because I know you guys haven't probably looked into that yet. But one of the subject matter experts that contacted me was uh, from Australian intelligence. And he goes, you know what? He goes, it's going to sound really off. But he goes, the South Pole, magnetic south, he goes, doesn't exist. He goes, everybody, everybody in the North Pole, everybody in the Northern Hemisphere on a globe takes it all for granted that the, the compass always, you know, draws north. But when you get south of the equator, eventually south should be the dominant force, right? You know, the South Pole, like a magnet. And he goes, he goes, that never happens. He goes, it always dominates north. He goes, the, the South Pole, mag- magnetic south, he goes, is not a thing. He goes, it's not a real thing. True statement. And that's what he said. No, I'm saying that's a true statement. I agree. Isn't that a little weird, though? Yeah. It is. Yeah. It is. I've never, I've never given that any consideration. Again, this is why I'm telling you I'm on the fence. Oh, well, well, okay. If you're on the fence, here, I'll see if I can push you over right now. Give me 60 seconds, and I will rattle off to you all the subject matter experts who have called me completely unsolicited. 
called okay. me, at, you know, after I made the clues and said, you know what, I think you're on to something. So, ready? Here we go. Uh, sure. U.S. Navy missile instructor, U.S. Air Force navigator, Marine Corps sniper instructor, Navy submarine chief, Army artillery radar operator, Australian intelligence officer, American flight instructor, industrial engineer specializing in valves and seals, a career surveyor of 32 years, international shipping expert, corporate travel agent, air traffic controller, United States Army master gunner, aviation and ground training combat expert, U.S. DA surveyor of 27 years, 32nd degree mason, etheric science researcher, commercial airline captain, commercial airline co-pilot industrial vacuum expert merchant marine army air traffic controller navy navigator and a navy electronic warfare technician which i know they've renamed to cryptological whatever that is yeah is it yeah so, but i i nobody it's like i always liked electronic warfare better so that's what i use and i, I met that guy in colorado springs he was he was uh he was a younger guy i'm, I'm getting old but Anyway, all those people, literally all of them came towards me and said basically the same thing. Yeah, we've all heard about the, the curvature of the Earth. We've all heard about the Coriolis effect, which means the Earth is spinning on its axis. He goes, but none of us, none of them uh, used those calculations in real life. In the, in the firing solutions for wherever they're firing, you know, missiles, howitzers, tanks, torpedoes, take, take your pick. None of them use the calculations and their firing solutions. And they just took it for granted. It's like, yeah, yeah, we heard, we, it's in the manual, but nobody uses it because you don't have to. Same thing with the, the surveyor, um, and not to go off on a little, quick little rant here, but the, there's two types of surveyors in the world. There's planar surveyors, P-L-A-N-A-R, which is literally plane. And then the, the other 1%, which are uh, geodetic surveyors, which only work with any project, I think that's over 200 square miles. And all the planar surveyors say the same thing. They, literally, the first page in their book says, okay, when you start your project, no matter how big it is, you treat the world like it's perfectly flat. And that's a problem because if you're, you know, linking stuff up like crackers, you know, you're, you're, you know, you got something to the north, south, east, and west and diagonals of your big giant square project, whatever it is, building an airport, building a car factory, whatever it is, somebody is going to have to take into account the curvature of the earth. And, goes, and they all say the same thing to the rookies. They say, don't worry about it. So let me, uh, and again, yeah. right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to counterpoint something, right? Okay. So if I'm going, let's say I'm going from Virginia to Europe yeah. on, a, on a ship, yeah. right? Yeah. Do I go in a straight line? You go however the GPS tells you to go. But remember, the GPS... Oh, I plot my course yeah. before I ever leave. No, I know. I know. It, you go... It depends. Yeah, the great circle. No, no. I, I got you. I got you. I'm sorry. And you're going from where to where? Say I'm going from, from the east coast of the United States to Europe. Okay. Or on the west coast of the United, from I'm going from from Whidbey Island. Well, let's say I've already gotten through the sound. I, I'm going from Washington to Japan. Okay. On a flat on a flat map, yes, it will end up to be a straight line. But on a globe, it'll be this curving, arcing thing. But either way, you get there. You will the the. Here's where things get weird. The course is different, but you're not going to really notice it from your point of view if you're looking at it from the outside it looks really weird uh, the perfect example would be it, i don't know if you guys again how much research you've done there was a plane i think it was last year you probably heard about it, a lady they were leaving from like the philippines and they were going to los angeles and a pregnant woman her water broke mid thing you know they were, they were going to connect i think through hawaii and in fact had they can had they kept going on a globe uh, on, a, on a straight shot they would have made it to hawaii but instead they diverted to alaska they went they literally went to a hospital in anchorage so why would they go to a hospital in anchorage and if you plot it on a flat map that's because the flight actually when you plot it on a flat map it's almost a straight shot near alaska they were actually closer to alaska technically than they were hawaii 
it gets really weird. But, but to your let's back up a little bit for your listeners. What we're talking about here, because a lot of people are going, well, okay, what does the flat Earth look like if if you're talking about all these routes? The flat Earth looks like a giant flat disc, a dinner plate covered with uh, some sort of dome-like structure, a firmament if you're biblical. Uh, if you're not biblical, some just sort of force field barrier type thing, like a like a snow globe, like a like a shallow sports stadium, where the North Pole is at the center of the map, and all the continents splay out kind of organically, and they kind of sp- spread out, they they kind of face the edges, which is interesting. And then the only continent that is different, every all the continents look pretty much the same, with the exception of Antarctica. Antarctica on a globe, it kind of looks like Australia. It's an island continent, only it's painted white because it's supposedly all ice. And on this, Antarctica is spread around the entire outside edge to where Antarctica is way, way more vast than we are told. I'm not going to lie. You completely lost me. Oh, no, I'm fine. No, I'm sure you are. You're a lot smarter than I am. (laughs) No, pull pull up. If you have the ability, pull up a picture. I know it's tough to do on radio. Well, okay, okay, wait, I got an easier one. I got an easier one. Ready? Uh, look up, you want to know how what, what Flat Earth looks like? Uh, well, at least the, the basic concept. Uh, look I, up the look, snow globe well, analogy is perfect. Well, not just that, but, but as far as the continents, how they're laid out, look at the UN flag. Because the UN flag, which is the same as the USGS uh, projection, which is the same as the Flat Earth projection, and I mean exactly the same of how it's laid out. Why is the UN flag why is the UN flag laid out that way? And you're saying, well, it has to be that way. Well, then why is not Antarctica in there? Antarctica is nowhere to be seen on the end, on the UN flag, which was designed in the the 1940s about the time right. they were in the middle of the, trying to discover this thing. I would say because it's not a nation. Just oh, the land without- that's good. Because yeah. and and why isn't and you're 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 leading right into it perfectly, which is why is not Antarctica a nation? Why do we sure. have a giant Nobody piece of property it. that's owned <laughs> by no one? In fact, they don't even nobody's even fighting over the ownership of this thing. They they locked it down in 1959 and said no country, no corporation can do business down there ever until the end of time. And they just completely glossed over it. Nobody, most of the people in the, the, our civilization don't even know that's the case. The 1959 Antarctic Treaty is the only unbroken treaty in the history of us. And it's fascinating. You should look into it. So, Mark, let me, let me, okay, right? Yeah. So, assume for a minute that I'm on board, Okay. right? Okay. Now... So, why have we been led to believe that the Earth is is round? I will drop a name just because I can in this case. Piers, okay. Mor- Piers Morgan asked me the exact same question. And okay. I told him this. I, I said, would you really break this story to everyone if you could? Meaning, let's say, for example, that we found out we didn't know let's say we're in a structure right we're in a building a giant sound stage and all the world's a stage shakespeare said that we're in this giant stage and it was so huge that it with, with floors and ceiling and walls and it was so big that we couldn't even figure out the the scope of it until about 1960 Right, because remember, up until you had the internal combustion engine, you couldn't really explore anything. You had wooden ships and you had horses, right? But remember, by that, Man. I'm sorry, yeah. and, sorry, and what? And Iron Man, wooden ships and Iron Man. Yeah. There you go. You guys, what do you expect? Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, we, we imagine this. Up until that point, though, up until about 1960, remember the whole Copernican model had been put in place, and science had been telling everybody, "Oh yeah, it's a globe, it's a globe, it's a globe." Even though there was absolutely no proof, unless you put every ounce of your faith in geometry. And it's like, okay, you know, you're 99 percent sure. Have you gotten up high enough to take the picture and to, you know see what it looks like? Let's say. They got off high enough to take the picture in about 1960, and then they realized it wasn't, not even close. Would you tell the public? Probably not, 
if the, if you're the powers to be. If you're an average person on the street, yeah, sure, fine. You know, it's one of the reasons this thing has spread as far as it has is because it's it's a really cool thing to talk about. It's probably the most interesting subject I've I've ever come across in my life. And well, what is the what is the so in 1960, what is the harm? Because we we've, we've had all kinds of theories dis, disproven. Yeah. Right? So it, what is the harm in telling in people? Hey, this has no bearing on anything about your life. Well, uh, not not no, not your well, life and not my life individually, but the institutions would be in jeopardy. Well, let me rattle them off real quick. There's it's it's a three part thing. First is academic. Sure. Uh, remember that, and, and it, of course, yeah, like any lie, it's like lying to your spouse. It just gets worse and worse and worse. If you're cheating on your, your spouse for a year, you might be able to get away with it. <laughs> You've been cheating on them for 25 years and then you fess up. Yeah, you're doomed. So it gets worse as, as, as the lie gets deeper. But let's say uh, you, this, this gets revealed tomorrow. Every university in every country, the astrophysics and astronomy departments, those things shutter, like close the doors. You, they, they do not open in the morning. And then the remaining physical sciences, biology, hydrology, archaeology, geology, t take your pick, any allergies that you can think of, those have to be retooled for, for the new model. That, that would, it would be massive. That's just the academic part. World markets. Remember, if, if, if people, we have stock market issues, if there's even, you know, even little skirmishes here and there, we have stock market ripples. Something this big, you would have to close world markets, just shut them down, just suspend trading for probably a couple months until you could figure out exactly what it means to the world economy. This is like you're talking about a whole new model, how to look at the world. There's an entire industry. Some would close, some would open. Uh, country, you know, geographic borders and, and the, the whole geopolitical climate would, would change literally overnight. World markets, they're not ready for that sort of thing. And then third, last but not least, in fact, this is probably the, the biggest reason is because all of a sudden you're giving the, the major five religions of this world, uh, um, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, you're all giving them basically the same thing simultaneously, which is you're saying, oh yeah, by the way, intelligent design is a real thing. And every one of those groups, and I was raised Christian in case you want to have a follow-up question. Uh, all of them would claim some part of this because remember if it's not a ball if it is some building that it was built by something someone and it's either one of two things either it's an advanced civilization or it is the divine and really you're kind of splitting hairs there and that is a very very potent um shot in the arm for all religions because what do you think they're going to do they've been they've been clubbed over the head with academic journals for the last five centuries and all of a sudden you're gonna you're gonna give you're gonna give the churches <laughs> back that sort of leverage because they're gonna come back and say oh yeah so you were wrong about this whole globe thing what else are you wrong about i mean credibility in science would would oh it'd be it'd be brutal People would be saying, okay, convince us that evolution is a real thing. Convince us that the Big Bang Theory happened. What about this dark matter you've been ranting about for the last 10 years? What about anything else? And then, of course, the subsequent, you know, why, you know, what happens to all the space programs that have been kind of, you know, just going through the motions for the last 50 years. So do you, do you believe that? I, I get you feel that the Earth is more of a uh, snow globe, I guess. I, I think I'm tracking on that now. <clears throat> yeah. Excuse me. But yeah. So, so is is outer? Do you believe outer space is real? Then. <sighs> Who told you there was outer space? And again, I'm not. By the way, I'm not. I'm not taking jabs at any of you guys. Um, no, no, uh, who who told all. who told you that there was an outer space? The same people that told you the Americans went to the moon. Those guys, because the the moon missions have not aged well uh the apollo program and i am sorry because you know, look i born and raised american rah rah go team totally get that but the if a production value is lacking it doesn't matter what country you're from it's it's lacking uh the apollo program was absolutely a fabrication from from second one but it was done for a very very deliberate reason which was they had to they had to when this thing finally when they finally figured out what this thing was 
they had to seal off the upper and outer edges very, very quickly. So the Antarctic Treaty, that, that's, that's snap. No one wants to go out there anyway in 1959. But remember, uh, NASA was founded in 1958, militarized the sky, and for the longest time, private companies weren't even involved. And you just go to the moon a whole bunch of times. Go, 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 go. Russia quits for no apparent reason whatsoever. The space race just came to this abrupt end. And then nobody ever went back. And they said, okay, it's boring. Let's 1972. Let's just wrap it up. Take a picture of the Earth. Good night, everybody. That was it. And then they shuttered the doors and they milked one picture of the Earth. Literally one picture for 43 years. Um, so I, how, how does GPS work then? GPS, for the most part, and I delved this, into this in the clues, is a land-based system. It is just the it is it is the old Loran system, L O R A N system, which is a ground-based radar with a new sticker on it, uh, probably augmented with spy planes or AWACS or take your pick. And and I kind of got into that in the clues because. I was watching uh, these flight trackers when, the, when were, these planes were going over these large bodies of water, uh, notably the South Pacific, the South Atlantic, the Indian Oceans. And I noticed that the planes, when they got out of range of the ground radar from any continent, they just blinked out. And the latitude and longitude points, the, you know, because it was tracking latitude and longitude, you know, every minute, uh, they'd go into estimated or approximated mode. And they would not come out of it until, magically, they came back in within ground radar range of the other the opposing continent. So when these planes are flying out there, yeah, they mostly know where they're going. I mean, the heading is the heading, but they don't actually know where they're going until they get a lot closer to their target, and then they have to adjust. And I think that's what ships have to do as well. People have said, oh, you know, do you track ships? It's like... The, the problem with the ships is, one, they move so slow that it's like watching paint dry, you know, if you're looking at it from a, a, a giant, giant map. And the other part, the other problem is when um, uh, ships get close to port, they have the ability that planes don't, and that is they can just stop. So if the port isn't ready for them, they'd be like, yeah, just hang out there for a while. And it's like, so the ship just stops. And so if you were tracking that ship for a few days, it's like, okay. So we basically stick with planes. So you're you're saying that basically the moon landing was was made up. Yeah, utter 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 complete studio, old school. Uh, and get, remember, the moon landing has been touched on at, pretty much ever since it happened. Uh, people have, have always been suspect of it. Uh, the the stories from some great documentaries on it. One of my favorites is probably uh, the, the, called uh, Room Two Three Seven where they talk about how Stanley Kubrick, not only did he do it, you know, that he was the, the, the chief engineer, you know, that they hired him and, because he, he did such a great job with the B-52 and the military stuff in Dr. Strangelove that they hired him on and paid him. Fantastic an, movie, by the way. Oh, Dr. Strangelove? Yes. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then they paid him, and then they paid him, uh, basically wrote him a blank check and told him, okay, what can, how, what can be faked in space? And he spent five years researching this stuff, you know, designed brand new lenses the whole nine years. He was, you know, James Cameron times a lot back then. And, the, and then the rumor is, is that they, he asked, he was, hey, can I use my, my research and turn it into a movie? You know, because why would I waste the, you know, the production value? And that's where 2001 A Space Odyssey came from, which was released in 1968 before Apollo 11, you know, landed on the moon. And if you ever watch like the Blu-ray version of uh, 2001, it is gorgeous. It is aged amazingly well. Uh, I mean, in fact, when you're, when you're zooming in on the moon in 2001, I dare anyone to compare it with, I mean, it's better, it's better than NASA footage. Because NASA hates zooming in on the moon for whatever reason. They're, they're just terrible at it. So, yes, the Apollo program. Uh, and and uh, real quick, real quick, if you guys want to break down, like, I'll give you three quick things of why Apollo was crap. Um, first one would be intersecting shadows. If there's only one light source on the moon, that'd be the sun. The shadows have to, absolutely have to be going all in the same direction. They do not. Uh, second would be the blast crater. There is no blast crater at all. This thing landed on what appeared to be uh, volcanic ash, and there was no giant cloud of smoke that should have been up for a very, very long time, and there was absolutely no no dust anywhere. No dust got anything. There was no blast crater. And, of course, m one of my favorites is uh, the astronaut suit, which I did a clue on just recently. I did clue 13 
which touched on the astronaut suit. And that was an astronaut suit literally is just a sack of air. It is just a, a fabric balloon. That's all it is. There is no technology either in real life or in science fiction, aside from an individual's force field that I, I could even conceive of that can fight the power of a vacuum. If you're in an astronaut suit and you were in a vacuum, that suit would go tight as a snare drum. It would be absolutely useless. You could not function. You would not be able to wiggle, wiggle your fingers, let alone set up satellite dishes. Uh, you wouldn't be able to bend your knees, your feet. You wouldn't be able to do anything. You would be a parade float. And they just glossed over it. And it's like, oh, yeah, we're just running around here. It's like, wait, how'd you solve? Look at the old footage of how they were trying to design the suits. They, they couldn't figure out how to solve the vacuum problem. They were coming up with plastic suits and partially metal suits. And then they just said, you know what? No one's going to know anyway. So let's just go with the fabric suit. And it worked. Everybody, everybody missed it. It was brilliant. I will tell you, I'm, I'm closer to the flat earth thing than I am the outer space thing. <laughs> Good. But, but we'll, we'll, we'll let that go. Okay. So you, you were in, you, you were kind of a conspiracy theorist for a while until you got, until you focused on flat earth. Yeah, I mean, I was, I had my opinion on just about every conspiracy because I I grew up on a, a, a very rural island. And so I didn't literally until I got to university, I didn't even think authorities lied about anything. I mean, I was just a dumb, blonde kid who was like smiling at everything. Going, oh, this is, well, life is great. And then I saw uh, JFK in the theater back in the early 90s. And I was like, wait, you know, you know, it was a it was a packed house and people were really angry. If you were old enough to remember that when it came out in the theater, that was not a happy time. Uh, it was uh, uh, Oliver Stone caught a lot of crap from the government. For oh, yeah, it. Absolutely. And after that, I was like, OK, so people do lie about things. You know, it didn't didn't occur to me that that, of course, you know, in the mainstream media, we only cover the stuff. Of course, there's conspiracies every day in business and politics and sports and entertainment. Take your pick. There's huge conspiracies in all of those all the time. But until you get caught, it didn't happen. Uh, you know, t one of my favorites is just a small one. Lance Armstrong, right? Lied for seven years. <laughs> didn't, didn't take performance enhancing drugs. Every day, won the tournament. They're trying to catch him. They're trying to catch him. And the, there's a lawyer's uh, word of advice, which still holds true this day. And that is, you never admit guilt until they have you. And he didn't. And then oh. when they caught him, it's like, oh, yeah, by the way, I was lying the entire time. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, it's, and, and to this day, I mean, look, for like Enron happened. We know it happened. Uh, but that wasn't the point. It wasn't like little things like like it wasn't that Enron happened and that oil and gas company frauded people out of billions. That's not the that's not the, the part that was important. What was important was they paid one of the largest accounting firms in the world a million dollars a day to cook the books. And when they went down, the accounting firm went down uh, because that's all they had. You know, even though 99% of that accounting firm had nothing to do with it, the whole firm went down because an accounting firm is based on, on integrity. Point is, there's conspiracies everywhere, and we only focus on the ones that, you know, that, that we can absolutely prove. And yet, we know full well there's all sorts of fun you know, ones out there. Years ago, I read a book called uh, by a guy by the name of Bill Cooper. I don't know if you've ever heard of I've it. I've heard of Bill Cooper. So, yeah, I read, read his book, uh, Be, Behold a Pale Horse. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And as I'm reading through this book, I'm, I'm just fascinated, one, by, you know, he's poking holes in things and some stuff that I was reading. I was like, oh, well, this dude's fucking insane um, because I know for a fact that that is in, indeed inaccurate. Right. 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 So I'm just curious. Um, like you said, you were trying to debunk this when right. you, you got into the whole flat earth thing. Right. right. And all this evidence or lack thereof is probably a better way to put it. Right. Um, that the earth, earth is indeed round. Right. Yeah, uh, and, by the, and by the way, we don't, the, anyone in the community, we don't even say round anymore. We say globe or sphere or ball because round can also mean a two-dimensional object as well. Just, just so you know, but but mainstream media loves using round because round's easy. But I appreciate the correction on the vernacular. No, 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 I'm just saying that's what we use. You can use whatever you want. I'm just saying that's what we use. No, no, I'm I'm on board, man. All right, all right, all right. So, so the the outer space thing, I'm not there with you. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, I 
do in fact believe that there is uh, above our atmosphere um, there is space. Okay. I do believe that. Okay. Right? No, that's fine. Um, now, <laughs> is there anybody who's a a flat earth theorist to use Andy's t vernacular? Yeah. That uh, that does believe in outer space, or is it like? Nope, yeah, yeah. As a as a matter, of, you're absolutely right. As a matter of fact, there is maybe I'm going to take a uh, take a guess here. Maybe thirty percent believe in a flat world with no dome, and that there could be space. However, most of those people fall into a category that uh, they don't. They just don't like being constricted. You know, they don't like, it's like, oh, they, they feel a little claustrophobic if it's this giant snow globe type thing. And we're talking a very, very big snow globe, if that was the case. You know, we're, we're talking a, um, uh, let's say you put a quarter down on a, on a table and then you cover it with a, uh, a glass, upside down glass cereal bowl type mm -hmm. of thing. That's, that's how big it would be because it took them a long, long time to figure out where the edges were. Meaning uh, Admiral Byrd, which is touched on in the clues, the United States Navy's um, youngest admiral of all time, probably the greatest explorer. He was sent down there in 1928 and he flew around in his own planes for basically 30 years. So the edge where Antarctica begins, the coastline of Antarctica begins and where the outer marker is, has got to be thousands of miles. Because they could not find, he could not find it with, with the ever, ever increasing technology of planes for the better part of 30 years. But to, 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 to do a writer on what you were just saying there, do, are there flat earthers that believe in um, kind of a space thing? Yes, but they have a problem with it. Meaning one of, one of the big things when it comes to a globe, and we've only been touching on this for, I don't know, last year, is the vacuum of space. Kind of like the astronaut suit, and that is, find me a scientist that can tell you exactly where the bleeding edge of the atmosphere is. Where does the atmosphere end, and where does the vacuum of space begin? Because we're talking about pressure versus no pressure. It's not like low pressure versus high pressure. It's no pressure if it's a vacuum. A vacuum is an extremely, extremely strong thing. And people say, and, and their only answer is like, okay, how is the atmosphere even still here if the vacuum of space is out there? And they'll say, well, because of gravity. It's the only answer they can give. And, and they, they follow that with, it's got to be gravity because if it's not gravity, we'd be dead. It's like, uh, but that you're, you're, going, you're, you're holding on to that and you're saying there's no other options. It also could be that we're an enclosed, pressurized system. And that's how the atmosphere stays in here, because like any pressurized system thing that we do, whether it be a planetarium or a terrarium or whatever, everything is contained on the inside. And that would make Mark, it I'm not a real smart guy, but mm -hmm. so you don't have to talk to me like I'm stupid because I, I pretty much am. That's okay. <laughs> what, sorry, what do you got? What, what, what about the ozone, the hole in the ozone layer? Yeah, yes. What, what about the hole in the ozone layer? What, what? Why was there a hole in the ozone layer at all? Was there, or was it just one of those things that was meant to reinforce the globe? I'll take it. I'll take it even a step further. Every space story you ever you've ever heard of was meant literally to reinforce one thing. They don't even care if you read the article. All they care is if you glance at the headlines. Meaning, and we've all heard these. Oh, there's a face on Mars, right? There's a hexagon hexagon pattern at the top of Saturn. We're reclassifying Pluto. Oh, look, something ran into Jupiter. Blah, 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 blah. All those stories are completely different, yet they all say the same thing, which is face on Mars, you're thinking about it from a globe. Saturn, globe. Jupiter, globe. Pluto, not Pluto, a globe. It is all meant to just reinforce. That is all that has ever been done for the last, well, ever since NASA has been founded, which is in 1958. Same, same thing with the ozone layer, which is, it, when they remember the ozone layer, they think most of that was happening in Antarctica, if I'm not mistaken. I, I'm old enough to remember that, where they got rid of, what, aerosol deodorants and, and McDonald's had to use paper wrappers instead of styrofoam and all this other crap. And it's like, really? I mean, was there really a hole in the ozone layer or was there something else going on that we just don't know about? Hard to say. That's, by the way, out of all the interviews, I don't think anyone's actually asked me about the ozone. Oh, so interesting. Yeah. Maybe I'm not as dumb as I thought I was. I, you're <laughs> not, Andy. Sean, 
going up for the good guys. <laughs> it's my one claim to fame. Let me put that down now so I don't forget about it. Um, so so I, I'm not on the fence like Chad. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm really having a hard time buying into this. Stuff I, know, here. I, I don't blame you. I, I, in fact, just so anyone that's listening to this knows, I am not here to convince you. Uh, I am not here to persuade you. I am merely here to put the seed in your head. And let you know what's kind of happening out there in the internet world. Um, it is it is a tough thing to get your head around. In fact, it is the ultimate open-minded test. I don't care. I said this literally in the first what paragraph of the clues, which is you could be the the, the most hardcore conspiracy guy in the world. And I have literally talked to people that just uh, will tell me straight to my face that the royal family is are lizard people. And then I'll gay. I'll say I'll say okay. Uh, what about flat Earth? No, we'll get the hell out of here. Get it. I, I will believe the lizard people wholeheartedly with zero convincing. <laughs> well, see, see, there you go. But but why? But of all the things, think about it this way. It, it's because you're conditioning. It is it is strictly Orwellian. Uh, or if you want to use Star Star Trek ne Je Next Generation thing, five lights versus four lights which is you've been told the globe for so long. It's put in your classroom when you're six years old and it stays there literally, if you graduate through high school, 12 years. And then if you go to, you know, you get your bachelor's, your master's, your PhD, if you have a master's uh, in physical science, a master's degree or higher in, in something, even if it's a computer science, you're, you're stuck. There's no way you're coming out of this. But for everybody else, it's it's just basically conditioning. Think about all the great science fiction stuff. You guys are probably sci-fi guys. All the science fiction stories you've read and watched, and you know, television and movies over the years. Didn't you think that maybe one of them? And remember, suspension of disbelief that one of them might be true because we've been talking about this as you know in different versions of this for going back ever since there was sci-fi. And it's kind of like the lottery ticket, which is nobody really, it's like, oh, you're just wasting your money on the lottery ticket. You're never going to win. And yet somebody does. Why not flat earth in this case? Why, it, why is it so much of a stretch for every, you know, you believe in all these other things, but you don't believe in flat earth. Same with me. Remember, I, I mean, it was literally the last book on the shelf. I would not look at it. Would not look. In fact, I, I'll tell you, there was, a, there was this weird moment when I clicked on my very first flat earth video back in 2014. I got physically flushed, right? And I know I caught myself doing it. I mean, I literally was embarrassed to click on it. I was alone in my house in Colorado clicking on this link. And I'm thinking, why am I getting embarrassed? I'm an average American guy. I've clicked on a lot of weird stuff on the internet. We've all been there, right? And it's sites you should not be at. And I'm not talking just about naked people. There's all <laughs> sorts of things you should not be clicking on. And yet it doesn't even bother anybody. It's like, oh, that's kind of weird. I probably shouldn't be on this site, right? And yet when I'm clicking on a flat earth video, why was I getting a visceral response to this? It was because of the conditioning. It was because something, you know, you've been, you've been, it's been beaten into you to where you're going. This is the dumbest thing ever. I was embarrassed to click on it and I was by myself. And that's how I knew there was something weird about it. And then, then of course I did the dumbest thing ever, which was I, I, I should be able to solve this. And if you're wondering how I was trying to debunk it, I did what most people do. And that is I leaned on the space program. I said, okay, well, it's obvious that NASA can shut this thing down in two seconds. I'll just spend a day going through NASA stuff. And then and, and you, every, every, th every time you think you've got something nailed down, uh, uh, another board pops up or another loose thread or whatever it is. And pretty soon you're sitting there and you can't sleep. And you're going, okay, I can solve this. It's like some weird little puzzle game that you, you just can't quite figure out. And you never will, uh, you know, either it's, it's like a marble in a paint can. You cannot get it out of your head. So, so oh, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, Chad. Go ahead. So Mark, you said earlier that you grew up, uh, you know, raised uh, Christian religion. Yeah. Are you still religious? Oh, very much so. Um, I wasn't. That was the other thing. Um, because remember, I was in, I was in tech support for 20 years. So, uh, and, and all my friends were heavy, heavy computer guys and, and we, we gamed a lot. And when you game a lot, you're dealing with a lot of simulated worlds and religion kind of takes a back seat because it's kind of boring compared to, you know, all the stuff you're playing. And I fell away from the church for a long, long time. I mean, when I, I mean, it started honestly when I went to university because up until then, literally until I got to university, it's like, wait, there's more than one religion. 
I say, seriously, <laughs> it's all these, all these different things. You know, the, the, the saying is there's a time and a place for everything. And that place is college. And that was for me, I, I fell away. And, and then when I got into this, I realized that we were talking about something. It, it kind of grounded me to where now do, would I, you know, do I go to church every Sunday? No, I don't. Um, but my sense of spirituality came back with a vengeance to where I have no doubt at the very least, very least, there is a higher power controlling this place. Am I arrogant enough now to, to put a name on that higher, higher power? No, no. And I, again, I'm not trying to offend anybody in the religious community. Again, raised born again, Christian. I have my, my views and my faith, but I cannot discount, uh, other religions. And I cannot discount the idea that, uh, God may have subcontracted out the work when this place was built, meaning, you know, advanced civilization, what's, what's the difference between a giant golden spaceship and the divine? As long as they're better looking than us, people are going to immediately think they're angels. So, sorry, that was my little rant. Let me, um, you, you mentioned the space program just a second ago. And I'm, well, first, Chad, did that answer your question? It did. Okay. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the space program. I, I have a hard time yeah. believing that the entire uh, I said I was going to say globe. I guess a faux right. pas on my part, I guess. Right. But the the entire, all of the nations in the entire world are in on this big conspiracy theory. I guess it, it about is space it, program. And because, you you would be right to think that. However, it's not. It's the exact opposite of something like the Manhattan Project. So if you're old enough to remember the Manhattan Project, you know, the, the United States building the atomic weapons and they was segregated or segregated, separated between three different locations in the United States. Hundred hundred thousand people worked on it. Nobody said anything. They kept the secret. And with this, it's much, much different. Uh, less is more need to know. I couldn't think of a better example of need to know if, if I tried uh, because this is so big, it really weighs on your conscience. The, the movie which I pointed to in the clues, uh, which is why it kind of answering your question about NASA, would be Capricorn One. Love that movie from the late 70s about how they were faking the Mars mission, uh, which is interesting because the whole film was made because a producer who actually watched the moon mission, who thought it was such a terrible production value, even though he didn't you know believe it was fake, he just goes, this is horrible. This is, this is the worst resolution I've ever seen. I could make a better move, moon thing production than this. And he did. He made Capricorn One, the, the movie. It was an independent. But what they, what they showed was in the movie that only the telemetry guys had to know. All the wrench turners, 99% of the people that work for NASA and corresponding space programs, they don't have to know anything. Uh, my next door neighbor at, in, when I was in Boulder was a guy named Wayne Ottinger. He was like the garage mechanic for NASA. He knew all the astronauts uh, on a first name basis. He, you know, you see pictures with him with all the guys that were still alive back then. Got phone calls. His walls were just bristling with NASA plaques. He didn't know anything from anything. He just built things. He built rockets. You build a, build a fuel system and an oxygen system and all this fun stuff. You're just building this. The only guys, the only place that you're really faking it is after the rocket takes off. After it just goes off into the distance, you just have to control the telemetry and say where things went and where the astronauts went. And to that point, I, you know, even the astronauts nowadays don't have to know as much as the Apollo guys did. I think the Apollo guys were actual real heroes. You know, they signed up, you know, Boy Scouts, just like, yeah, we're, you know, gung ho. And I think they told them just like they did in, in Capricorn One. And it, it really, really affected them to where they said, OK, any other space stuff moving forward, there's just going to be disclosure agreements, meaning uh, you guys, it's kind of like spies. Spies are paid to kill people in some cases or steal. Let's say kill people, though. But they're not paid to know why. You know, they're just pieces on a board. It's like, okay, you have to shoot that guy. No, you're not paid. You do not have clearance to find out why you're killing that guy. Same thing with some Air Force guys. And these guys, remember, all, all most of your astronauts are Air Force. So they sign the agreement. They fake whatever they have to fake. They fly, you know, float around in their khakis and their polo shirts and their socks. Why no shoes? Uh, and then and that's it. And they, they their, their conscience is mostly clean. Hey, uh, hey, Mark. This is uh, Leia. I have, I have a question. I thought, I thought you were just having food. She <laughs> was. I right. really right. else already. Couldn't, couldn't help yourself, could you? I couldn't. Right. I couldn't. So you know, 
I grew up on a little island in the middle of the sea, so I'm really simple minded. Totally <laughs> <I'll laughs> simple minded. And not as simple minded as Andy. <laughs> so great. <laughs> no respect. <laughs> Your pizza wasn't that good. Shut it. <laughs> so you're saying so that saying. it's kind of like a snow globe, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, and it really, whatever relates to like a dome. Like I'm picturing, like uh, what was that TV show, The Dome? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I had a guy. Yeah, called Under the Dome, actually. Yeah, Under ba the Dome, based so on a Stephen King book. Right? Yeah. So you're saying if I keep going straight in a straight line, right, for however long I'm gonna hit. The edge of the dome. Eventually, sooner or later, you will run into the outer mark of the edge, yes. But okay, it, has it, anybody, but it's, see, I, I'm just having a hard time with this. So has anybody hit the outer marker yet? Civilian? Uh, probably not, uh, because we wouldn't be allowed. It's one of the reasons the Antarctic Treaty was put into place. But military, oops, sorry, hang on. I got to turn off the sound on this. One second. Sounds mute. All right, we're good. Still there? Yep. Yes. Okay. So, um, okay. So, it's, so civilians, no, but military, yes. That, that was the whole point, which was in 1926, Admiral Byrd uh, went to the North Pole in a rick well, I shouldn't say rickety plane. It wasn't terrible, but in 1928, he, that's what he was flying around 30 years to find. In fact, that's a fascinating part of the story where it, well he if I think he did I think he did find it meaning he was flying around again for the better part of 30 years and then all of a sudden he I, I think at one point they even gave up looking for it they were looking for it for so long they were looking for it for like 25 years could not find it they just kept going out further and further and further it's like you know what who cares right no one's going to go out this far so w what does it matter and then he goes on television in 1954 on a, a show kind of like a 60 minutes type thing called the long jeans chronoscope and i put a clip on it we were so lucky to get it, it was from a cbs affiliate and it's on it's on YouTube and he's talking about how he's going down for one more mission and that everyone's just like, you know what, we're just gonna make money. The whole place is basically made out of resources, let's just carve it up. And then he goes down for Operation Deep Freeze in nineteen fifty five and nineteen fifty six, and I think that's when if I you know, ever had power over time and space, I'd love to see the day you know, when he found the outer marker. And that's when they shut it down. It was like it, it, it was the absolute opposite. It was one of the big turning points for me, which was all these countries were down there. Uh, United States, Great Britain, Argentina, Chile, New Zealand, Australia. Take your pick. They were all any after World War Two. They were all down there. And then all of them simultaneously got off the ice like like their feet were on fire and they locked it down with the Antarctic Treaty. It, basically, basically saying that something down there was so big it was so important that money didn't matter anymore down there and it was fascinating so sorry short answer to your question yeah i think the united states and the soviet union figured it out simultaneously in about 1955 1956 found out the outer where the outer marker was and they were the only ones and then after that they just put a big chain on the whole but thing Shouldn't there be an outer marker all the way around the plate? Yes, yeah. yes, and you have to defend it all the way around the plate. Uh, but luckily for us, or I should say luckily, you know, I say that the wrong way. L luckily for them, they're wet. the whole place screams go away. There's huge amounts of natural reinforcements, that negative reinforcements, which you do not want to go there. I mean, even you, your ship captain, you go down there, the water gets cold enough, what, 15 degrees, icebergs start forming. And then when you get to the Antarctic coastline, most of it is like a 200 foot wall of ice straight up, not as high as like Game of Thrones style, but it's pretty high. And then when you, if you can get on top of that, then it slopes up to about two miles. Most of the continents at 14,000 feet altitude sickness kicks in at about seven and there's nothing, there's no resources. There's no, there's no plant life. There's no animal life. I, I don't count the penguins on the coast. I mean, it's not like you're going to kill a million penguins and use that for food on the way in. And the, I mean, the, it tastes like chicken. Yeah, it's, yeah it tastes like, like chicken. I mean, but like as, but as far as like civilians, let's say you were a civilian, right? And you had enough money, and you want you were it's like I'm just gonna hire a, a big big Learjet with a whole bunch of fuel, and I'm just gonna get out there. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go see it. Well, you got to hire a pilot that's willing to do two things that most pilots aren't. One, they have to completely ignore GPS. 
Because remember, GPS not only kind of tells you where you are, it'll steer you where it wants you to go. And it's never going to let you go that far. Plus, you'd have to ignore the compass because the compass readings would be all wrong when you uh, when you got out there. So the average civilian would never, ever run into this. There's so many layers of things that would stop you from accidentally running into it, especially mo most notably just is Antarctica itself. It's just a horrible, awful, terrible place that you know you don't want you know it just so where, where's the other boundaries i just keep hearing about antarctica so where's antarctica the rest of the is it's think of it this way if and I, I know i'm probably not doing it justice the outer edge of this place would be like the outer edge of a lake right people say okay why doesn't the water fall off the edge it's like okay why doesn't water fall off the edge of a lake it's like oh because it's surrounded around all sides with land in this case all the land is really just one thing and that's antarctica if you want to call it Antarctica north, south, east, west, that's fine if it makes it easier for you. But basically what we're saying is there's land on all sides. It's, it's, the border is massive. There's, there's got to be thousands of miles of inland. You know, it's this giant ring, but the ring is, is much, much thicker than most people. It most, when you're doing the diagrams, when you look it up online, the, the little visual illustrations of it, the, the, the outer rim, doesn't, it's not even 500 miles. But in but that's for for practical purposes because it could be much much bigger. Sorry, so I, I got a I got a um, we kind of got sidetracked off on a tangent. No big surprise. Yeah, uh, but pretty much uh, what happens. Yeah, it's the story of my life. Uh, but, I go uh, off into the weeds all the time, so you guys have to stop me. But right. but anyway, going back, you, you, I never got an answer from you with regards to is there space? Is there an outer space? Oh, it, it, what? Okay. If all right, here's here's the if you will we'll assume that I, I'm going to come to you from the point of the people that believe in a dome, right? If you have a dome, which is like again, I'm old enough to remember the planetariums, and I don't know when remember the last time you guys were at a planetarium, but they've been around for a long time. Sure. If you're inside a planetarium, because I had like an amateur astronomer from Great Britain tell me it's like oh, I've seen the moons of Jupiter through my telescope. It's like that's great. I go, take a pair of binoculars and go to a planetarium and look at Jupiter. Does it look more or less real with the binoculars? And they go, well, that's not the point. You're in a building. I go, yeah. Who's to say that when you walk out of that building, you just didn't walk into a much bigger one? So the answer to your space thing is, if you think that space, if those lights up there are, are is space, that's fine. Who's to say that, though, since you can't get up there, that there really is space meaning does there have a lot of people say well a lot of people again because we're just it's drilled into our heads that we're in this you know solar system model if and that's why they always put the flat earth in the middle of space i just love that it's like they put these like the flat earth disc in space it's like why does there have to be space if the the dome can simulate space you don't need space on the other other side now that doesn't mean there isn't something out there uh, but I don't think for a second it's it's just this this vast empty empty place that even Carl Sagan was the first one one to say it's like man it seems like a waste because there's just there's just nothing out there if you believe in outer space if and and again if you're the religious type I'm not saying because the, uh, the Christian community and other religions have come at me and said okay you know you're saying that that if God is all powerful then God would make a solar system and God would make a galaxy and a universe I'm going yeah. But wouldn't God also want to be efficient? Because if 99.9999% of the population believed in the illusion, believed that the ceiling full of lights was space, that's what you go with. That's, that's what we do here. That's what we do in all our... And human beings are really, really susceptible to illusions. Uh, I, I use... We're in fact, we're scientific studies. We are terrible. Yeah, real quick. Go ahead. I, I'm confused now. So is the sun real? Is the sun not real? Sun's real, but it's very, very small. Oh, you know what? We forgot that part of the, the model. The sun and the moon are in probably inside this thing. If the dome is like a shell, if it's like a shallow sports stadium or a snow globe, the sun and the moon are probably right in here with us, or at the very least, right outside of it. Very, very small. So the sun would not be 400,000 miles across. The moon wouldn't be 2,000 miles across. They would be tiny by comparison. And just well, Hold on. You said maybe the sun's outside of it. So maybe, maybe, maybe just out. That, I'm sorry. Go ahead. There, there is something outside of the dome. Well, 
I get, oh, no, no, I'm not saying there's, there's nothing no. outside of the dome. I'm just saying that it's probably part of a bigger mechanism. And again, it's it's speculation to say if the sun is inside or outside. I like it on the inside. A lot of other people do, too. Uh, but I'm just kind of throwing in the other stuff for people that say, again, I'm trying to include the people that say there is no dome and then the sun and the moon are kind of hanging above. I'm kind of trying to come up with a middle ground there. But if the sun and the moon would be about... The, the exact if same size. Virginia in August, you would believe that the sun is inside. <laughs> well, yes. Oh, 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 here, here. Let me let me rattle off something for you real quick because remember the the moon. What I mean is that the sun and the moon would be less than fifty miles across, which is still pretty big, and they are the exact same size. You're going, well, I don't know. It's like, well, you know, the moon does fit exactly in front of the sun. You're going, well, that's a coincidence. I'm going, eh, that is a pretty good coincidence that the sun or that the moon is. 400 times less diameter than the sun but it is also 400 times closer than the sun so yeah it fits exactly in front of it that's that's fine I'll, i might give you that coincidence maybe um also interesting though is that we only see one side of the moon at all times which is you know i mean exactly one side of the moon it doesn't even shift a quarter of a degree in five years it's literally we never see the dark side of the moon we only see one face and then the thing that somebody threw at me recently, which uh, well, I shouldn't say recently, 18 months ago, where he said, he goes, he goes, did you know that the moonlight is cold? I go, and I laughed. I was in flat earth for at least a year and somebody said that. And I said, what do you mean it's cold? And they said, well, it generates a cold light. I was going, I go and explain. I go, well, you know, you're in the sunlight. You know, it's, it's a hot day. It's 90 degrees in the sun. It's 80 degrees in the shade. We already know that. But if you're in the moonlight, let's say it's 50 degrees in the moonlight, it's actually 60 degrees in the moonshade. It's warmer in the moonshade. In fact, it gets weirder than that, where you can take a magnifying glass to moonlight and it gets even colder, up to 13 degrees, as a matter of fact. And it's like, okay, does that prove a flat Earth? No, no, it doesn't. But it really creates a problem for the relationship between the sun and the moon. Because if the, if the moon is reflecting even a tiniest fraction of the sunlight, because that's how it glows, supposedly, then at the very least, it should be neutral or, you know, or leaning towards uh, half a degree, one degree warmer, maybe, uh, but never colder and never, never colder all over the place. And people have been, you know, I tested it myself. You take a $15 point and click infrared thermometer. Go out and check it yourself if the moon's high in the sky and works better if it's a full moon. It's it's absolutely fascinating. Are there no other planets then? Are they they part of this big cover up as well? Is Jupiter a real planet when you're in a planetarium? Yes, it is. Can you land on it? No, you cannot. So and not to use a cop out line here, but reality is in the eye of the beholder. So if, again, I, I, don't, I don't want to quote too much chapter and verse because I'm not that kind of guy. But if God created the sun and the moon, it was NASA that told us how big they were and how far they were away. If, you know, the, the really, really great pictures of Jupiter and Saturn and all that stuff, those are taken from NASA. We can take some blurry shots from down here, sure. But they're just lights in the sky. But then they're reinforced to us by artists who have gotten better over the years and said, oh yeah, by the way, this is a really super crisp picture of Saturn. And don't get me started on that Tesla thing in case you were going to bring that up. No, like I said, I'm not that smart. But anyway, <laughs> going go back to Jupiter. Shooting yeah. his car in the outer space. <laughs> the, the, the car, that roadster in space. Oh my God. But, but Jupiter. Um, yeah, Jupiter. So is that outside of the... the no, the no, moon? no, it'd be, it'd be inside. It'd be part of the sky. It'd be part, no different than the stars. Really, the difference between a planet and a star is just luminosity. It's just the size. It's just literally the size. They move around in different patterns, sure. But they're just, again, they're just pretty lights in the sky. No, no different than the moon would be a night light and the sun would be a, um, uh, you know, a daylight. Terrible choice of words. But it, think, here's, here's another one real quick. When, because uh, I had a chance to go to the eclipse last year, the, the blackout zone. And that, that right there should kind of raise some flags. And that is, why is there a blackout zone at all? Because the moon is 2,000 miles wide and the blackout zone was only 70 miles wide. So way, way, where in normal life do we see a reduction in shadow of that extent? Meaning when you walk by a building, 
your shit, you know, you're say you're six feet tall, that would take you, you know, it's a 97% decrease. Your, your shadow would be the size of an action figure or smaller. And then you, we never ever see that. And people say, and then science will come back and say, no, 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 the, the moon's actually acting like a convex lens and it's shrinking down the shadow. I go, okay, then it should work both ways. Meaning when the earth gets in front of the sun and we have those blood moons, and the Earth is four times wider than the moon, then we should have a blackout zone of, say, 200, 250 miles. So why don't we ever see that blackout zone on the moon? We only see a blood moon and this giant curved thing that goes in front of the moon. And the blood moon, again, we can simulate a blood moon very, very easily, you know, with our tech and, you know, a small scope. So why don't we see the blackout zone there? Uh, I've, I've put some of these questions to, to academics that want to, to go up against us. No one will go on record. No one will talk about it. Look, I, I want to shift gears. Yeah, just a little bit here. This is kind of a kind of a silly question, I guess. But um, so I, I don't want to get into politics. I really don't. Yeah, you can go into politics. I don't care. But but what do you think of Trump and his space force? Uh, that again, that was a great. Uh, you know, as if if you look at it like moves on a chessboard, that was actually pretty clever, because of course he's not going to do it. There's there's huge logistical problems with the Space Force, one of which is if you're going to create a sixth branch, branch of the military and you're going to call it Space Force, you would destroy the recruiting efforts of all these other groups instantaneously. Who, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard. Is anyone going to join those if there's a Space Force coming on board? You, you think you're getting I anybody am. from high school to join anything? No. I am. I'm, you, you, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come out of retirement. But yeah, you you you're joining the Space Marines. You're you're joining Starship Troopers. You're going to be the Hudson and Hicks and Vasquez. Oh, exactly. you're, you're, shoot up some Vasquez aliens. Shoot up some aliens. <laughs> you're, you're not. It, it, it was a, anyway, it was a great. It's a great little drum beat. It goes along with the face on Mars. No different. And that is uh, when any any time any president says, "Oh yeah, we're going to do uh, we're going to revitalize the space program." You know, no different than Elon Musk when he says, "Oh yeah, we're going I'm going to send two tourists around the moon in 2018." He said that in early 2017, and it, here we are in 2018. It's never going to happen. He's he's already said, "Oh yeah, we're, we're postponing that." He's going to kick the can down the road. It's never where he says we're going to colonize Mars by 2030. We're going to send people up there by 2020. All this other crap. Uh, it's it is literally just again. They do not care if you even believe in the article. All they care about is if you look at the headline and and just make a mental note of it. And that is, oh yeah, space force because we're on a globe and we're going to send space marines into space to do what exactly i mean we, we we to date we've only had even 500 people claim in the history of our civilization to have been in space what exactly are you going to do with the space force what how, how what exactly is you going to even go to accomplish that have even announcing a space force means that you've already got established moon bases and established mars bases and by the way where are the moon bases not to go off on another tangent but the, remember, if you're old enough to remember the space race itself, which was the Americans and the Russians, you know, they do this, we do this. And then all of a sudden the Americans get there and Russia just quits. They, they just stop. No, it would have been the exact opposite. It would have been we put three people on the moon. They put four. We put a small base. They put a bigger base. And then Time magazine runs the story. It's a cliche, which is it has the space it has has the Cold War reached the moon. That's how it would have gone. But no, they could not do it that way because it's two entirely different production teams. They could not line them up. And they said, OK, America's got the better stuff. We're just going to let them run with it. Russia quits. Nobody else goes ever. Nobody else talks about going ever. No. That's because nobody likes a quitter. <laughs> why, 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 why don't you quit drinking, Dad? Because I'm not a quitter. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you if there's any correlation. And, and, and again, I don't I don't say this to offend, but no. You know, um, you said you got into this about 2015. Yeah. Right. 2014, 15. Yeah. 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 Right? Two, yeah. Two, summer of 2014 was literally the first video I clicked on. So is there any correlation between your conspiracy theory uh, interest yeah. with the legalization of marijuana in Washington in 2012? I'm just curious. Oh, dude, and that's that's really interesting. No, I'm, and by the way, that's that's totally original question. I'll give you kudos for that. Uh, <laughs> no, um, no. As a matter of fact, it's weird because I I've never really been uh, a drug user. I, I mean, I've had my share of alcohol. Don't get me wrong, uh, but marijuana really didn't do much for me. I don't know why. 
Um, and I stayed away from almost all hard drugs you could think of. But yeah, it was weird was because in Colorado, it was legalized when I was there. And then it was legalized in Washington when I went there as well. So it was... It See the was, trend. No, it was, it, I, it was, <laughs> it was strictly, I, I will say this. I had a weird moment. It was, wasn't a, I necessarily, a, I think a paranormal moment or anything like that. But uh, the morning, I know exactly when I, when I flipped, which was morning of uh, February 10th, 2015, at about 3.30 in the morning, I woke up and I had this, again, this Jerry Maguire moment, but it was more than that. It was like someone had jammed some sort of carrot into a food processor. If my, my brain was a food processor, it was like, Rawr! you know, and, and all of a sudden I had all this stuff in my head where, I mean, I immediately got up and took a shower and I've never written so clearly in all my life. Kind of like the Jerry Maguire thing where so you, I, said, you said you had a, it was in the morning. Yeah. You woke up in the morning, had, so my question is, who spiked your drink the night before? Uh, it's, no, I was I wasn't even dating at the time. It was just me. I I had been kind of on my own doing my own thing for a couple years, and I don't you know, trust me. I've gotten all those questions before. It's like you know, have you ever been committed to a mental institution? Were you on psychotics? Blah blah blah. No no no. Trust me. I hated flat Earth. Hated it for the longest time, and even when I made uh, the clues. When I put them out there, I was kind of holding my breath because part of me wanted, literally wanted somebody from university saying, all right, here's what happens when you do this and this and this. You're all wrong. You can shut down the YouTube channel. Go away. I Part of me wanted that to happen because it's like, okay, I can go back to sleep. And, and again, kind of like the Neo thing. I wanted to go back to sleep. And it was the, the exact opposite. It was like, as soon as I did it, it was like an amusement park ride just showed up in my living room. And it's like, it's okay, what, what do I got to lose? Got on, and three years later, now I'm, yeah, doing this. How many times have you been accused of being crazy? Not as many as I would have thought. Really? Uh, no, no, hardly, hardly ever. And I don't know if it's because we're living in an ever-increasingly hypersensitive PC world. No, you know, Mark, you know what I think it is? Mm. I... I I think it's because you're very well spoken. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you're very well researched and well read, and you don't you don't come off as crazy. Yeah, that's probably it. <laughs> no, no, that's I, what I, I will say. This there's a there's a documentary. Uh, uh, you, you know, you're probably right, and, I, I, and thank you for that. Um, there was a, a documentary team that followed uh, some of us around of all 2017, and it's on the website. In fact, they finished it. I watched it up at the Toronto Film Festival just a couple months ago. It was, it's called um, Behind the Curve, and the website's called BehindTheCurveFilm.com. And th I, I mentioned that because that's exactly what the director told me. He goes, he has, you come off as such a normal, non-crazy guy, not, you know, the, you know, conspiracy people, you know how they are, most of them, sure. it, it, we all know. We've all, we all have a conspiracy friend that's literally like Charlie from the movie 2012, played by right. Woody, where, Woody Harrelson. We all, we've all got one of those. And I, for whatever reason, apparently have disguised most of my little tells that I'm really insane to where, I, yeah, I just come off pretty normal. That and I hate to say it, but a lot of it's just career training, which is I've done so many thousands of hours worth, worth of phone work. I don't think... Uh, under a really high stress situations, usually with, you know, really overpriced software that people, you know, on the other end are threatening to sue and cry and kill and, and all this other stuff to where I, you know, I try to stay the course no, no matter what. And, well, and, and here's, I'm going to, so I think I found a parallel with, with flat earth and my own personal beliefs and things. Right. Mm -hmm. So. I'm not a religious guy. Okay. And part of my problem with religion is why is what you say correct and what they say incorrect right. when half the world believes differently than you, yeah. what makes them wrong, right? So right. I draw this parallel with this. This is why I'm not throwing rocks at the flat earth theory. Okay. You know, here's what I believe. 
And there are people with regards to religion that wholeheartedly deep in their soul believe that their belief is correct and my belief is wrong. Right. Right? Yeah. And there's that's impossible to prove. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you're right. It is. And I kind of took that from the other side, which was science. And I... I just, I've, I've said this time and time again, I love science. You know, I'm, I'm talking to you on science right now. I mean, you, you try to show this to somebody even 50 years ago, the system that we're talking on, and they'd be like, holy smokes, these people are, are witches. And in fact, if you go back 200 years ago, we probably would have been burned. Uh, but at the same time... Lane's a witch, by the way. Oh, okay, cool. Just out the W. Yeah. Oh, oh, I got you. I know, I thought you were going to go down the, like the Wicca path or something. I've known some of those. Uh, I'm a get it right. Uh, true. true. No, the um, so uh, w there was a the most arrogant one of the most arrogant things I've ever heard in my life was when Neil deGrasse Tyson said that science is true whether or not you believe in it, and I I took I took some offense to that. I was going okay. I don't think you can say that anymore because it kind of delves into religious rhetoric there, where it's like okay you want to tell me the boiling temperature of water at sea level that's fine you want to tell me when paper burns that's fine uh you want to tell me what the core of the earth looks like well, no don't don't be jumping there because I, the deepest hole ever drilled is eight miles and you're telling me what's down at four thousand miles how do you know any of this because and you've been telling us this for a long time and you're telling us about you know the core the core samples of all these other planets some planets you have never even supposedly been to so where does that come from uh, you know and and so when i when i look at science in fact i'm doing a clue i'm gonna release it wednesday it's called the code of credibility which goes over how anyone with a lab coat is immediately given more credibility than other people and science has taken that, I think, too far. Again, light bulbs, air conditioning, microwave ovens, fantastic, great. I love all of them. Uh, I don't know if I would agree with that last statement just oh. because I've seen Andy in a lab coat. He's a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> I don't ever take him seriously. I know, but, it's, <laughs> but for the most part, lab coats, they people take. Well, uh, the, the, one of the examples I used in the clue, which you, you may get to see, was Bill Nye. Bill Nye is, is the epitome of that, where he put on the freaking lab coat for a stupid skit. I'm, up from, I'm from Seattle. He's, he's not even an L.A. actor. He's a Seattle actor. That, I agree with you on that. Yeah. 100%. And then he get. But the thing was what killed me, and part of this I, I got to blame media for, where they – so fine. He gets on this show called Bill Nye the Science Guy. It runs five seasons and then gets syndicated. So it's kind of in the same sort of loop as Electron Company and Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers and that sort of stuff. And then he starts getting invited later from, from people that kind of grew up with him that gets invited to talk about stuff. And because he's an actor and he's good on camera and he wears the jacket, he looks credible. And so he's being brought on stuff. He's talking about climate change. He's talking about polit the geopolitical climate. He's talking about, you know, the Mars rover. He's, he's, he's visiting the White House. It's like, what? Why, why, why is all this stuff happening to him? It's because he wore the coat. Because we burned into people's heads that anyone with a lab coat knows better. You know, that he's, he, and he, he does, you know, granted, he's tall and thin. He has angular features. He looks like an absolute uber nerd. No question. Uh, but does that mean, but he's got a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. That's it. He never, and he abandoned it immediately for acting. So why, why does he, why does he get to, and, and I'm sorry, the, the part that bugged me was, is that media is lazy along those lines, meaning they know it's harder. It's not as, it doesn't play as well to, to grab somebody from MIT, the, the local PhD from there, and pull it on camera because they're terrible on camera. They're monosyllable. They're, it's like, yes, I agree with that statement. You, you yeah. know, Mark, you've said, you've said something that, hmm. that just kind of struck a chord, right? What? Now, I, I obvious you're a believer, right? Yes. And... And I know there are, you know, tons of other people that are as well mm -hmm. that are really, you know, they, they research it a lot like you do. They read, they, they investigate. But I also think one of the reasons potentially that this movement is getting so much traction mm -hmm. is because of the bumper sticker effect, the quick headline. 
you know, to, to throw that back at you a little bit. Sure. Quick headline. This is something that's going to grab somebody's attention. Keep their attention for the 15 seconds that, you know, current media, that that's what we want. I want 15 seconds of your attention and we'll move on. In some ways, it, it does kind of feel like that, but that's only from the surface level. Meaning, yeah, from the media standpoint, they can't see, they, they keep circling back to it. And the reason why they keep circling back to it is because people that are in the community, once, uh, not to use too many cliches here, but once you go down that flat earth path, you don't go back to the globe. Uh, if, if you, if you believe, you know, if you, if you get to that point where it's like, yeah, it's flat, you can't go back to the club. It's, it's really that red pill, blue pill thing to where we've got like a 99% per, uh, retention rate, which is bigger than most of your organized religions and even someone on the outside. I mean, if you would have, if Scientology had a 99% retention rate, they'd be a lot bigger. Um, because when you, when you start going down it, you, you, it's kind of like going through a, a tunnel where you're, you're trying to resolve it one way or the other and you're just you're absorbing so much so much content and then when you come out on the other side you either believe it or you're against it it's it's kind of weird very few people are, are on the fence for, for very long it's usually okay i'm from a science standpoint flat earth's the enemy and you know i'm going to do everything i can to to get destroy you or you're you're a flat earther and it's like oh yeah which opens up your mind to so many other things which is really strange because once you become, if you be, become a flat earther, you're all the other conspiracies that you may or may not have looked at before. You're opening those books up completely again. It's like, oh yeah, I got to totally revisit this library because you, you, you kind of see it with new eyes. So this, the media started out pretty slow at the end of 2015, but we have gotten so much press since then. I, for example, when I was doing the Raleigh conference, and we didn't even invite that many media to come down to the Raleigh conference. I think it was interviewed 14 times in two days. I, I missed most of the conference itself. Like the, the exception of my sessions, I was, and these were not small hitters. You know, this was ABC and BuzzFeed and Australian TV and German TV and British BBC. And, and it was, they... They're, they're fascinated with it because, again, kind of like you guys, it's, it's a marble in a paint can. For them, they, they, they look at it and they, then they come back and look at, wait, why are these people still believing it? So they, the, what they hope is that it goes away. And then they, a couple months later, they're realizing it's not. They see another celeb come out or another, you know, whatever story, either here or abroad, and they just can't seem to get enough of it right now. Mark, I have to kind of piggyback off of what Chad was saying earlier. I. Yeah. I don't think, well, first of all, um, when I was researching this topic to do a show on, I have to agree with what Chad said. You, you are very articulate. You're, you're very smart. You're obviously um, well-spoken. First first of all, I, I think you'd make a fantastic nuke in the Navy. Um, a nuke? That's besides the point. Yeah, it's an, a nuclear trained individual. Work, they work on... Nuclear know, engineer. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I, that may or may not be a good idea. We won't go there. Um Secondly, I, I don't think you're 100% crazy. That's Ma good. Maybe 60, 70%, but, but who is it, right? <laughs> right. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm sorry, and I'm not calling you out too yeah. much, but I, I just I cannot wrap my, I, my that, mind around it. That's okay. I don't look, I do not blame you at all. Uh, I cannot tell you for the amount of interviews I've done, I, there's been a whole bunch of interviews that didn't happen. Because the uh, the people on the other end, like for example, they were just scared to death. Uh, a perfect per example would be the Alex Jones show. They contacted me pretty early on, and this is the Alex Jones show, right? They talk about a lot of stuff. Alex Jones wouldn't have you on? No, no, he would, and he called me. I don't call anybody. They, they, you know, my phone number's out. He, they, well, he didn't call me directly as producers because he just does his own thing. And the literally the conversation went something like this. Can we do a flat earth show? How long would we be able to do a flat earth show without actually saying the words flat earth? <laughs> and I said, I don't know if you danced around it, maybe 10 minutes. It's like, yeah, <laughs> we, we can't do the show. And mostly they were worried about the blowback. And, and I can't, I, I had so many conversations with people that were doing like big, big podcasts, you know, like had 60,000, 100,000, 200,000 subs. And, they would all say the same thing. It's like, I'm really nervous about doing this one because I'm worried that the, my audience will come back and say, 
why did you even give him or that ty- that topic the, the time of day? So, we, yeah, when you say, look, I, I'm not, don't get your head around. Look, I don't blame you in, in the slightest. I mean, so there's... You- you brought up Alex Jones. I got to know. Yeah. What's your feeling on the the nine eleven? Do you believe? Oh, you want me? You want first, we, You can rattle off by the way any conspiracy you want. I don't. I don't mind. Um. I. But I. I will preface it with this: all other conspiracies outside of flat Earth, I put on a second tier for obvious reasons because it's just not nearly that big. But I will answer any questions you have. Do you think of a conspiracy? I got an opinion opinion on it. Nine eleven. I usually <laughs> try to answer it with Building Seven. That's the the same thing that got Rosie O'Donnell uh, kicked off of the View for four years, which she goes she goes why isn't anyone talking about Building Seven, a fifty story building that dropped at free fall speed, a plane didn't run into it, had a little fire in the basement, had no visible damage on the outside, and it just collapsed. It just lost its will to live and collapsed. But that wasn't the part that bugged me the most about that that building. What bugged me the the, the most was the British television team. And again, it's on YouTube. You can watch it yourself. The British television team that announced that Building Seven was going to go was was had already collapsed twenty minutes before it fell, and it was in fact it was behind her shoulder. News people. It was behind her shoulder, you know, you could see some of the smoke. And so, and I knew exactly what had happened when it happened because I was in the time and attendance industry. I was teaching time and attendance software. And I go, oh, they screwed up the time zones. Because when the, uh, when you're, you're doing some sort of operation like this, you make sure it's completely orchestrated. You send the script out to whoever you need to. And the British television team that was over there, were, they were told to read this report at a certain time. And instead of reading it 40 minutes after it fell, they screwed up the time zones. They read it 20 minutes before it fell. Because remember, this country, love it, love this country. A lot of people still don't realize there's four time zones in this country. It's not just three. People think it's always Pacific and Central and there's Eastern. No, there's Mountain. There's Mountain time zone. It's also Mountain. I can't tell you how many conversations I had with people. Anyway, so sorry. That's my 9-11 thing. What else? What about you know? There's five. <laughs> yeah, there's five. I, I okay. I okay. I don't count Alaska. I don't count that tiny tip of Maine, and I don't count Hawaii. <gasps> Why not? <laughs> not for time <laughs> zone. Not for time zones because there's just it's just. Don't exist? Are you no, saying we don't exist? <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. Who cares? No, the, I'll use no. I'll use the Simpson line. It's the it's the freak states. Alaska and Hawaii mm-hmm. was it's like. Eh. Lay certainly is a freak. I'll tell you that. <laughs> oh wait, why is somebody from Alaska? Uh, no, Lay is from Hawaii. Oh no, I'm not. Not look, Hawaii. Hawaii is a great, great place. Not, not, not. In fact, I may be going there in a couple months for a meetup out there. But it is. It, hey, oh, in fact, you could probably answer this. It's it's a neat little trivia question. Where do Hawaiians? It's not a joke. Where do Hawaiians go when they go on vacation? Waipahu. Vegas. Fe- you're at Vegas. Vegas they go to freaking Vegas. Isn't that weird? They go to the middle of the desert. <laughs> well, weird. Not, not really. I mean, I, I lived in Hawaii for six yeah, years, yeah. and if, if you think about it, you're on the rock, so why wouldn't you want to go somewhere where, you know, the sky but, but, I mean, but they all say the same thing. It's always Vegas. It's like really not, not like, you know, some part of Northern California or some beautiful Hawaii. part. I'd rather go to Seattle than Vegas. Yeah. I'd rather go. I'd rather go to San Francisco or San Diego. Or sure, but... there there is a pretty big Hawaii population in Northern California. Mm-hmm. I did not know that. San Jose area specifically. Yep. Any so, uh, any, yeah. day. Mm-hmm. any other conspiracies you want to? No, no. I was just curious. You brought up Alex Jones, and and I've heard him I, 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 countless times talking about nine eleven, Building Seven, thermite paint. Uh, you know. Oh, thermite paint. That's a new angle. I hadn't heard that one. You haven't heard the thermite paint? I haven't paint. heard thermite paint. <laughs> That's good. Actually, I mean, I, I believe in thermite. I... Alex Jones, thermite paint was actually Jesse Ventura is where I heard that. <laughs> oh, wow. It was oh, thermite wow. paint. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, no and, and, but at the same time, Alex Jones will not go against NASA. Yeah. Joe Rogan will not go against NASA. In fact, coast to coast. I thought that was strange. I did an interview with those guys, with yeah. George Norrie. And he said, he said really early on, he said on air, it was kind of a warning to me, which was just so you know, I completely believe in the Apollo missions. So, so we've got Spencer, um, he's on, on our, uh, coming in asking a question. He wants to know what about chemtrails? 
I honestly Please. don't have much of an opinion on cam trails. Only that yeah. I I believe they exist. I absolutely believe they exist. I think that I think there's something up there. Sure. Do I have any freaking idea what they're doing? You know, are they part of what Morgellons disease, or are you know, are they biologically changing us, or are they obscuring the sky? There could be so many different things to, that's happening up there. I just don't know if I can pick one. And I think anybody in the community, and the reason I say that is because I've talked to a whole bunch of people about a whole bunch of conspiracies, and I, I can't get any sort of compass reading on on chemtrails. Nobody agrees when it comes to that. Everybody, there's ask a hundred people, you'll probably get a hundred slightly different answers. I've got one for you, and I, I already know the answer, at least what you're going to say, but uh, huh. you ready for this one? I am. Aliens. I, no, no, no it's good. It's good. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how to delicately say this. In, you don't have to be delicate the, with us, the, I promise you that. All right, screw you guys. No, the um, <laughs> in the aliens model, the in, the in the enclosed world model, aliens are not from Mars and Jupiter and Venus and all this, you know, that we see in the movies. What about now, your are, are they what? <laughs> Sorry, juvenile joke. I had to go there. I said, what oh, you're Uranus? <laughs> yeah. No, it, they they don't. They, they're they in here. There's, there's only two options. They are either in here with us or they can travel freely about the system. And I'm kind of torn on that because I, be, even before I got into Flat Earth, somebody said, hey, you want to have some fun? It was a, this obscure little video where a guy goes, he goes, take some night vision binoculars and start watching the sky. And I said, hey, I'm in Colorado. That sounds like a wager. So I went out and shopped around for different night vision binoculars and, and got a pair and, and started looking up the sky. There's a lot of weird stuff flying up there that you can't see with the naked eye. But at night with night vision, you can absolutely can. So is there stuff flying around with us? Yeah, you bet. Uh, do I think that Roswell is the greatest sighting of all time? No, nor do I think Aurora, Texas, 1899. I don't think it's the, the best one. The best, you want to look up some fun stuff. You Anyone has any doubts about aliens whatsoever, look up a, a, something that's totally glossed over with the exception of one episode of Ancient Aliens, which even they only half-assed it, which is the 1561 Nuremberg event fascinating fascinating like two giant armadas fighting over the city of nuremberg in 1561 for a solid hour to where the sketch artists you know because there's no cameras sketch artists were just drawing like crazy you know between having toast and schnitzengluben because i think it was like eight o'clock in the morning the beautiful <laughs> april day and it was just fascinating two giant armadas went at toe-to-toe -to -toe for an hour and then finally a third faction shows up with this giant single black angular ship the other two just scatter like the sharks and the jets that's an old reference and it's like what what Western is it story. what's what's <laughs> happening you know why that raises so many were you snapping your fingers just then yeah, sure. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> i totally got that <laughs> <laughs> da -da 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 -da. yeah and and it was like it raises such questions about the hierarchy which was one who were these two first factions right Th who was the who was the third faction were they the cops were they the un but the part that bugged me it's like what what sort of response time an hour it's like you know i i could i could dial nine one 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 exact you know even up here accidentally in my phone there's gonna be cops here in six minutes so anyway my, my theory is simply two kids fighting and mom shows up. That could be it too. Well, they were obviously in a place. I do think, I do believe in the prime directive and I do think that there are older civilizations. That That's another one uh, real quick, which is I do not think we are the first uh, people to rent this apartment by any stretch. I think there are older civilizations that have come and gone. Every civilization gets a certain amount of time. And when they peaked out, hit their high water mark, they have to transition off like seniors graduating from high school because they got to bring another freshman class in. And that's where I, I think. And I think once you graduate, I think you can kind of linger around, but you can't interact. Again, prime directive, which is you can't land on Main Street, USA, come out, take a couple pictures, a couple selfies, sign a few autographs, wave hello, and then leave. You can't. It would just it would create too many ripples within that civilization. And so, which is why I think the 1561, I don't know who those jokers were that were, were fighting above the city, but it was a major metropolis back in back in the day. And, and yeah, hopefully they got in trouble for it. <laughs> so um, this, this has been pretty fun, actually. I got to I got to ask you, is, yeah. is this one of the, the more entertaining interviews you've had? Yeah. Yeah, this has been fun. I, I've, I've really enjoyed it. I, I, yeah, most of the time it's 
it's pretty serious and you guys were 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 great uh, you asked more questions than normal you gotta remember a lot of the people that i talked to they if they're if they have they're they're not really into conspiracies at all so they're on their heels most of the time yeah. and you know they're they're uh, you know you can you can hear them it's like after like my first 10 minutes they'll be like wait he's still talking about it. like I, i'll give you real quick real quick because i know we got to go pretty soon which is um uh stanton friedman you've heard of that guy yeah yeah so he he and i got into a debate once on air and i knew he was going to sleepwalk his way into it because you know why why wouldn't he you know the one of the greatest ufo researchers of all time and he comes in and we're about 10 minutes in and all of a sudden it's dawning on him he's like wait 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 he stops he goes you're you're talking about this like it's a real thing. It's not a metaphor for something else. It's not an analogy. He goes like this is real, and I go, yeah, yeah, flat is a real thing. And he goes, he pauses and he goes, well, how does that work? And it's like, oh no. And then the debate was pretty much over. It was basically me trying to explain how things work. <laughs> you, and, you know, you know something, Mark. You said you mentioned real quickly. You mentioned Joe Rogan. Yeah. Right. Do you ever listen to his podcast? Yeah, I do. Joe Rogan, he hates. Well, he hates and he loves us, and I feel bad for Joe. He, well, so you've obviously you know who Eddie Bravo is. Then oh, I'm assuming very well. I know who Eddie Bravo is. Yes, and I'm just curious if you've ever had a conversation with Eddie because I've 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 listened to him try to explain theories on flat Earth to Joe Rogan, <laughs> and Joe starts laughing. Right, Eddie, uh, Eddie won't talk to me. And the reason is, is because he is an Eric Dubé fan. Um, there's, there's, you know, there's different people in the Flatters community and some of them do not play well with others. Eric Dubé is one of them. He's one of the early guys. Uh, he's, he's out of Thailand. He's an American and he does martial arts and Eddie Bravo was sort of, sort of gravitated towards him. Um, but, uh, Joe Rogan, I, again, I feel bad because he, somebody got to him a long time ago. I, uh, you know, Joe Rogan was the type of guy he went after NASA. He would do. He hated the moon missions. He tore Apollo to shreds, and then all of a sudden he goes silent for a while. And when he comes out, he's got a brand new show on Sci Fi Network called Joe Rogan Questions Everything. And literally in the first episode, he recants everything bad he ever said about NASA. <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's that's natural. That happens. Which, which of course, is shows that show is no longer on air. No, you, well, they only give you he only they only gave him one season. Kind of like, okay, we're going to give you a season, and if your ratings are good, hey, maybe you'll get picked up. And it wasn't, uh, but he's still very influential. He's got a massive podcast and a, and a giant following, and he gets you know he he brings astronauts on and Neil deGrasse Tyson, and yeah, Eddie Bravo. I don't know if he's a thorn in his side or if he's letting Eddie do that. Uh, so Eddie and and Joe are actually very very good friends. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and that's what it is. So they sit on the podcast, smoke dope together, and Eddie goes off about flat earth. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I'm not exaggerating. I mean, yeah, that's, that's just that's that's pretty much. I know. I, I, love, I love Eddie Bravo for doing it. I wish he would talk to me, but I know that he doesn't trust me because, you know, when, when his, his guy, his flat earth guy, he says, no, Mark's a government agent and blah, blah, blah. If, <laughs> if Eddie... How the hell are you a government <laughs> agent? That's what I want to I know. know. I'd be the worst government agent ever. I would be the Gomer Pond of government agents <laughs> it was it's, it, it's they they it's it's no it's people that just want they don't want to share uh, the, with the other children and so when what's the easiest way to do it discredit them how are you going to discredit a conspiracy guy tell people he's a government agent even right. though i've been called so many things in the last three years uh, hollywood producer actor uh, Wall Street guy. Um, I was even called a. I was even accused of being a large Jewish woman a couple months ago. So <laughs> well, those are all nicer than things that I've been accused of. So that's, <laughs> but uh, Mark, thank you so much. I think oh, thank we need you. to wrap this up. I okay. know you're a busy man. We're we're pretty busy as well. Not really, but I'm gonna fake it till I make it. Okay. But uh, listen, we really, really appreciate you. Really appreciate it. It's a very interesting conversation. Yeah, oh, happy happy to do it, guys, and and thank you much for, uh, for inviting me, and uh, thank you for for not calling me a whole bunch of names. <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, crazy, I guess is a name, but you know, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Uh, I'm just kidding. Anyway, hey buddy, listen, thanks a lot again, and uh, hopefully keep in touch, and we'll we'll talk to you soon. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank take you. Care. Bye bye. Bye bye.